praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined, predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be in the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom he also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after, also after that you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Here we see the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, uh, the grace and peace to the church there from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, that grace, unmerited favor. We don't have peace with God, so we're in the grace of God, called by God in Christ with an indescribable, unconditional grace, an ocean of grace that is redeeming grace, then into sanctifying grace, then into sustaining grace, strengthening grace from the birth of the new birth in Christ all the way to glory. We are in grace. It is all grace. That's the power. Of God. It is the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, which live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. It is the grace of God that teaches us all of these things. Otherwise, we're not under the grace of God. We're under the law. We're still under sin that has dominion over us, and we're going to walk according to our own lust. We're being taught to do ungodly deeds, ungodly ways by our father, the devil. Yes. By a father of the devil. And so he says here. He says. Repent. Blessed be the God and Father. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. In the heavenly place in Christ. So he's blessed the believer. His people. With every spiritual blessing. In the heavenly place. That is unfathomable. That is an indescribable. Inexpressible statement there what we really have. We don't really believe what we have when we're born again in Christ, but he's given us everything. The, otherwise, we're under the curses of God. We're cut off from the life of God, eternally damned in hell fire. So in Christ, we have all the blessing, all the reward that he earned from his perfect life of obedience, uh, his atoning death on the cross to bear those curses of disobedience for his people under the glory of God the Father. So those who are in him are blessed with all that inheritance, joint heirs with Christ, in his eternal kingdom. What hope we have in Christ. Uh, you know, hope and joy and expressible full of glory. A hope that does not disappoint because the love of God's been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And we're going to go on in this path. He predestined us into the adoption as children of God. that was predetermined before the foundation of the world. God chose himself a people from the fallen mass of humanity, fallen race of Adam. God chose himself, elected himself a people out of that mass. Christ came bought their souls, died for them on the cross, bore their sins once and for all, sat down at the right hand of God, all praise, and we get adopted into the family of God, manifested in time, the moment we believe this gospel, we get quickened by the Holy Spirit, called out of darkness into his light, we become a people of God, we become a child of God, we become children of light, that's the power that God does in every one of his people, by the work of the Spirit of God, thank you Jesus, we give him glory for that today, and it's according to the good pleasure of his will. Because it pleased him to do it. Accepted in the beloved. So God, so that his grace would be praised. The glory of God's grace would be praised. All of grace, praising that grace, worshiping and adoring that grace, that mighty grace. He made us, the church, the bride of Christ, those who receive Christ, accepted. It were accepted, it were acceptable in the beloved. We're unacceptable to God apart from Him. We are loathsome in turn. We are dead in trespass and sins. We are criminals in the eyes of God. We don't have any virtue or merit at all. In the flesh no good thing dwells. But God by His own grace made us accept
accept it in the beloved by his power, his redeeming grace, his effectual call, his blood shed, his atoning death, his resurrection. We are raised in with him into newness of life. We are raised with Christ as we are crucified with Christ. The true believer has been crucified with Christ. He doesn't live anymore. The life he lives in the flesh, he lives now by the faith of the Son of God who loved him and gave himself for him or her. So you are dead to sins and alive to God. Romans 6 covers that whole uh, scenario there. How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? We're not under law, we're under grace, right? Sin shall not have dominion over you. That means living in habitual sin and lawlessness. The new man can't sin. He says, whoever is born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. That means you're still going to sin. Yeah, the flesh man, the old nature's there, but it is subdued. It is rendered powerless by the new man that says we walk in the spirit, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We walk in the spirit because we have the Holy Spirit. We're born of the spirit. Otherwise, it is flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we have a, a, a nature we deal with. These two natures are contrary to one another, so we still wrestle with that as believers. But through sanctifying grace, we overcome. We deny these things and we grow in strength to follow Christ and to do His will. And God's grace gets praised. God's justice was praised at the cross of Christ. That justice demanded punishment for sin, and Christ took the punishment on the cross for sin. There's no more sacrifices. There's nothing you can add to this work. It is an impeccable work. It is a pure work. It is a holy work. The work is finished. And this is the work of God that you believe in him whom God hath sent. Have you believed in him whom God hath sent? Have you come to your Savior, to your King? Come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be in scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They'll be a red, like crimson. They shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you should leave the good land. If you refuse to rebel, you should be devoured by the sword. That was a prophecy to ancient Israel. They got devoured by the sword. What happened to the sharp two-edged sword? That comes out of the mouth of the Son of God, which will strike the nations and rule them a rod of iron. That sword's coming. Have you obeyed the gospel and entered into the new covenant with God? The covenant of faith, the law of faith, according to Romans chapter 3. It is by faith that we enter this grace in which we stand. The faith of Christ, it is given to you by God. It's a gift of God. Eternal life. And so we have, we, we have that redemption through his holy blood, the forgiveness of sins. Again, according to the riches of his grace. Where he hath abounded to, towards us in all wisdom and prudence. In all wisdom. It was the infinite wisdom of God that made this. Not possible, but a guarantee. It was the wisdom of God because no human wisdom could make a person who is defiled and guilty not guilty. How could a criminal that's proven guilty in a court of law with all the evidence thereof be just? That is the dilemma that God solved in his infinite wisdom. And only God could do that. And how did he do that? He himself became a man. He himself obeyed what you and I have disobeyed. He himself laid down his own life in the body, fully God and fully man, to die in the law place of guilty criminals. And God made him who knew no sin to be sent for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the justice was satisfied completely by Jesus because God cannot violate his own justice. It's an abomination of God to justify the wicked or condemn the just. Jesus being just, his people being wicked. But all of this transaction occurred by the perfect, uh, holy sacrifice of Jesus and all the attributes and qualities of God. All those qualities of God magnified. Wrath of God pacified. Justice of God satisfied. Uh, the grace of God displayed. The love of God manifested. Unconditional love. That God would send forth his son, born of a woman born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that they may receive the adoption of sons, that God would send forth his son when we were out strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You're justified one time, one time transaction legally in God's courtroom. Your case is dismissed the moment you've trusted Christ. The moment you believe in Christ, you've got a legal right standing with God. And the evidence of that justification is sacred.
sanctification by the Spirit to bring you to glory, to conform you to the image of Christ. God works all things together for the good of those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many, many brethren. So God saves, calls, he justifies, he sanctifies, he glorifies. It is the work of God. Thank you, O Lord. And we boast in God because we have nothing of ourselves to offer God. Have you realized that for yourself now as you hear the word? Have you realized that you are destitute? You're lost, you're bankrupt, you're blind, you're miserable, you're naked, and the shame of your nakedness will be revealed on that final day. Without Christ, all the exposure of who you really are to, to your just condemnation. Oh, your only hope is this King who bore all this on the cross. You have trust in Him and not seek to establish your own righteousness. You have nothing to offer God. Your religious works are filthy rags. Your church attendance, your baptism, any work you've done, you trust in that, you'll go to hell. You trust in the risen Christ. You trust in the risen King. You bow to your God now and be saved from this wicked generation and enter into the kingdom of God. Repent and believe the gospel. He says, he made known the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. The mystery of his will. What's the will of God? Your sanctification. The will of God is that God will redeem his people. The will of God when the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ coming to fulfill that in the volume of the book. It is written of me, O God, to do your will. He took away the first to establish the second. The first covenant could not save. The first covenant under law condemns. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. Now we get the ministry of the Spirit. We are sufficient in the Spirit as ministers of the new covenant. Hallelujah. And so we have the covenant of grace. We have the covenant of life. We have eternal life. And that life is the light of men. That is Jesus himself. The life of Christ. Salvation is a new creation. The life of Christ. The faith is the life of Christ. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith you understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. The things that are made were made of things that are not visible. And so we know that it is Jesus of whom and through whom and to whom are all things to whom belong the glory forever. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things and in him all things consist altogether. He is preeminent, supreme of all. This Christ is worthy of all allegiance. Pay homage to the Son, kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. In Jesus' concrete name. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Be not deceived, folks. God is not mocked, and God will render punishment to the proud. God will give a just recompense of reward. If the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Of which it first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him. God also bearing witness with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Oh, friends, you know he is God. We suppress the truth in our own ungodly nature and heart to rebel against him, to defy him, to resist him with as much as our strength can possibly do. But give him glory, he alone is God, and one day you'll stand before him. If you don't get restored to him now, one day you'll be destroyed by him then. Repent and live. Humble thyself under the mighty hand of God. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The wrath of God. To get God. You want to, you like all that stuff they tell you on TV and then health and wealth and prosperity, then go to hell with those false preachers. You like what the Pope tells you about things you want to hear, about a false love, then you'll go to hell with him. You want Christ up in the Word of God. See if these things be so. 
Look in to the perfect law of liberty is able to save your souls. We are born again, not of corruptible, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is like grass, all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. Are you doing the will of God? The life of Christ in you and through you doing what God wants you to do, that you have forsaken your own life, you've lost your life, that Jesus said, I have come, that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly, that abundantly is not just the things of the world, and the cares of this life, although God is abundantly gracious and provision to his children, above all that we can ask a thing in many ways, but you come to God not for these things, these temporal blessings, but the eternal blessings of the Holy Spirit. Repent and turn to the living God today. You're going to be ba you bow to Christ to serve God. You surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, to worship the Lord God in spirit and in truth. Now, why do you need to be saved? You're guilty before God. Who do you need to be saved from? God himself, as the judge of all the earth, who do rightly. How can you be saved? Believe on him who justifies the ungodly, and faith will be accounted for righteousness. Jesus paid the penalty. You need to be saved from God, from his wrath. Your sins separate you from God. You're dead in sins. That sin is removed in Christ by faith. It's a gift of God, eternal life. It's not by your own will, your own works, but it's by the grace of God and the work of Christ. Have you come to him? What do you do with your life, young people? What do you do to do with your sin? What think ye of Christ tonight? How many more things are more important to you than God? How many more things are in your life that you put before God that are damning your soul to hell that's going to keep you in bondage? He who the Son makes free shall be free indeed. Freedom. Freedom. Joy. Peace with God. Not the peace that the world gives you, the false peace. He says, I told you all these things that in me you may have peace, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good courage, I've overcome the world. If you truly believed in Christ, you're going to be of good courage in the days to come of destruction from the Almighty and the wrath of God being poured out upon the world as you endure by the grace of God and worship God. No matter what circumstance you're in, as apostles, apostles have learned to be a base, have learned to be ab learned to abound, have learned to be a base, have learned to be full, a hungry, suffer need in all things. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is Christ. Are you meditating on that thing, bringing those thoughts into captive to Christ? Are you a true believer? Or are you a professing believer and denying him by your own works of disobedience to, the God, to, the, to his word and to the nature and character of God? To repent from all your idolatry and lust and greed and pride. Come to Christ and you'll continue to repent and believe the God we believe throughout the time of your life on the earth as God brings your known sins to mind and God continues to reveal that you are vile and you are apart from God, you're going to continue to confess your sins as he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. His blood cleanses us from all sin continually. His whole bride, his body, the blood flow, the blood flow flows through the veins of his body. His people to purge, to cleanse them from impurity, to make them more like Jesus. Don't just tell me you know, you know God, you believe in Jesus Christ, and you're living in habitual sin. You keep you living a lifestyle of lawlessness because you don't really know God. The Bible takes care of all those things. Read the book of James, read the book of 1 John, go through the whole entire word of God. There's no way that God leaves anybody living in habitual sin. How should he who died to sin live any longer in it? If you're alive in Christ, present your members as instruments of righteousness, as alive to God from the dead. Christ makes a person alive from the dead. Spiritually, you live after the things of the Spirit. If you've been raised with Christ, set your minds on things above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. You've got all your focus on these temporal things that are passing away. They're going to rot and burn. And you're going to lose your own soul there, too. Think about one thing, dear friend. If you can't even handle a stomach flu for a little while on the earth without murmuring and complaining and being paralyzed on the couch, vomiting in that toilet. How are you going to handle hellfire for eternity? Are you prepared to meet your God? Come to Christ. There won't be any music in hellfire. 
and we're weeping and gnashing of teeth. You better get right with God.